All right. There we go. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Cherry Conneran, and I am with KRES Kickers. And this evening, I am super excited to be able to bring to you, as you can see from the, his background, is from MD Anderson. And I'm going to do my best not to screw up your name again. Dr. Marcelo uh, Negreo? Negrao. Negrao. Dr. Negrao. And he's the assistant professor at the Department of Thoracic Head and Neck Medical Oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And he is in Houston, Texas. And this evening, we're going to be talking about updates and opportunities around KRES research. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm really happy that you're here. And um, we've been very excited about some of the information and in the clinical trials and everything that y'all have been going on. And you're one of the lead um, KRES researchers. And before I go jumping in, let me just remind everybody, please keep your screen muted so that we don't have to listen to anybody's dog barking or anything. And if you have questions, go ahead and post them in the chat. But um, I was gonna have the doctor just kind of go through things a little bit real high level and mention some of the clinical trials that they've got that either they've just got starting, they're just opening up and some excitement um, around it. So take it away. All right, thank you so much, Terry. Again, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here discussing all these exciting uh, upcoming trials, research developments in the space of KRAS mutant cancers. Uh, as you know, you and I have been, have been connecting for a while now. I'm really excited and, and proud of the efforts that, that you put together, together with all of this group of, this very special group of people. So I'm really, really excited to be here and participating with you guys. So just to give you a little bit of background on myself, like we were discussing before, so uh, I'm a thoracic medical oncologist here at MD Anderson. My main focus at this point is what I call MAP kinase addicted lung cancers, right? So that would include patients that have uh, KRAS driver uh, oncogene mutations in their cancers. Uh, that would also include patients that have BRAF uh, activating mutations in their cancer. Uh, and the, the second avenue, which is one that I think Mr. Williams is alluding to in the check, uh, chat box, is development of adoptive T-cell therapies uh, for solid tumors, right? And, uh, and the, that's going to be one topic that I'm going to get to at the, the very end of a very short slide deck here, which is one of the, the trials that we're very, very excited about that we recently activated, and that I think represents a very novel and unique opportunity uh, to, uh, to discuss T cell therapies uh, for patients with KRAS mutant lung cancers, as well as other solid tumors. Okay. Um, so I'm going to quickly share my screen. Uh, as as I, I promised Terry, uh, I, I, I promised her I wouldn't bore everybody with a very extensive slide deck. So I did keep it very, very brief and very, very short. But I think it's important for you guys to, to, to be aware. And I, and I just wanted to increase awareness to the whole group as to what research efforts we currently have ongoing for patients with KRAS and lung cancers. Uh, I also wanna highlight that this is a, it's really an institutional effort. Uh, the trials that we're gonna be discussing, um, it's not just me that's the PI for them. There's a lot of investigators and, uh, associated with these efforts. And I'll promise that I'll, I'll highlight the, all, all efforts and all credit where it's due in regards to all these, these studies. Okay. So I'm going to quickly jump into where we are in terms of the advanced KRAS G12C pipeline. Uh, of course, this is the one that right now is the most extensive because the, these, these drugs are already in the clinic. One of them is already approved. Uh, so you can, uh, you can automatically expect that this is going to be where the, the bulk of the research efforts are ongoing right now. Uh, I put this figure right here on the right just to make it easy for people to track if they're not familiar with these medications as to what exactly they do and what their role in terms of KRAS signaling is. Uh, and that's also going to help us navigate some of the trials that I'm going to be discussing. Okay. So starting off with the Adagras of efforts. So this is the, the compound that was formerly known as MRTX 849. Uh, the first ongoing effort that we have right now, and it's one that was just recently activated, in fact, this is an amendment on this protocol that just got implemented, is the combination with adagrasib and cetuximab. So adagrasib is a G12C inhibitor, and cetuximab is a monoclonal antibody uh, that targets EGFR. 
So I, I listed all the, the clinicaltrials.gov numbers there in case uh, you guys want to jump in and gather more information. So this combination comes from preclinical work that suggests that when you inactivate KRAS, uh, you have upregulation, so increased expression of EGFR in the surface of the cancer cells that can re-engage KRAS signaling and also activate bypass pathways like, for instance, this one that I show here on the right, the mTOR pathway. Which I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you. I'm gonna make sure. you slow down just a little bit, okay? Sure. All right, um, because uh, I wanna make sure that we understand the flow, okay? So just go through healthy flow, if you would, like just looking at the diagram, and then if you just kind of point it out, okay? Okay, sounds good. I can start from the top here before we jump on this time. So essentially what this figure on the right here is showing is how KRAS signals to make cancer cells grow. Okay. So KRAS is not something that's necessarily bad for us. Like KRAS actually regulates a lot of the functions in our normal cells. It's what makes uh, the cells grow. It's what makes our cells divide. So it's an important process for, the de for our development and to sustain our life. Okay. Mm -hmm. The problem starts when you have mutations in KRAS and that leads automatically to this process of growth and proliferation to go unhampered. And that's what triggers cancer. So the way that this happens here, so let's start off by the KRAS here that you see right in the center, which is the core of this. This, this, this molecule, it can be found in either an off state or an on state. Okay, so you're, you're over there by the red and the green in the middle, right? Correct. You can see my mouse, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah it's just a little mouse, I'm sorry. <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> So essentially what happens is that in general, in, when you have normal KRAS, this cycling here between on and off is very finely tuned and regulated so that KRAS works when it's needed and it turns off when it's not needed. So if you have the, the transformation of this into a KRAS mutation, like for instance, G12C, what happens is that you have a shift here towards the green making KRAS be, sort of speak, stuck in its activated form. And that's going to start leading to growth and to spread and to proliferation, which is unhampered. And that's what's going to drive cancer. So when this happens, there's two key pathways that KRAS regulates okay, that leads to proliferation growth and so on. So the one that you see here on the left with these elements here called RAF, MAC, and ERK, this is popularly called the MAP kinase pathway. The one here that you see on the right with these three factors, PI3 kinase, AKT, and mTOR, this is called the mTOR pathway. And both these pathways, as I said, they're finely tuned and regulated by KRAS activation. So if you have this turned on consistently, it is gonna to lead to what you see here in the bottom, which is tumor growth and tumor and cell proliferation. Now, the whole point of this figure here was to show potential areas where we can drug this pathway to hamper cell growth and to hamper cancer growth. So what are the mechanisms that regulate the switching of KRAS on KRAS off? So this thing that you have here in blue, which is GEF, this is called guanine exchange factors. So this is gonna lead, this is one of the things that's gonna stimulate KRAS to be turned on. And one example of this is a molecule called SOS1 or SOS2. The other thing that you're gonna see here that makes it then turn off is the GTPase activating proteins. So GAP proteins. And this is gonna lead KRAS to be turned off. If we go up here towards the top, you're gonna to see that there's two molecules that finally regulate this process. So one of them is what I just mentioned, SOS1. 
And then SOS1 is regulated in part by another molecule, which is called SHIP2. So which is this factor here. And then these two molecules are under the regulation of a, of a receptor in the membrane of the cancer cells. One of the examples here being EGFR. Right? So in a nutshell and, and very quickly, and I, and I hope I didn't burden everybody too much with a lot of information, this is how KRAS regulation happens both in, in cancer cells and in normal cells. And it's the KRAS mutation that's the, at the center of all of this that leads this process to, to be disrupted and lead to cancer development, okay? So I'm gonna stop real quick because since I'm sharing my screen, I can't see the question box, question box to see if there's anybody has any questions on this. No, I, I, think, I think we're good. I just kind of wanted to start with a good lay of the land. Sometimes these are like the first time somebody comes in and these things are still intimidating for me to look at, okay? Um, and, and I've been seeing them, but they're still intimidating. And so let me, let me see, we're following down. If we're looking at this, this is just a pathway of how this, the KRAS starts happening and it starts coming down from the top. And so EGFR, which is a different type of cancer as well. Okay. But that's part of our pathway to get into, into ourselves, correct? Am I saying that right? Okay, and so it's starting at the top and it's kind of like following it down as though it's like a circuit. And, it, and our KRAS gets flipped on and it's staying on, which is what's causing the mutation to happen. And the location, it's made the, the wrong protein. And so like the KRAS should be a G protein, but instead of being a G12 protein, it turned to a G12C protein, okay, right? And this is just showing what happens. And so when we're talking about doing pathway drugs or pathway treatments, these are the pathways that we're talking about doing. Like we're start, gonna start talking about here in a minute. Am I, on, am I on track? You're on track. Okay, cool. Does anybody have a question? Just hit your little button or wave your hand at me frantically. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, keep, we're gonna move on down. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for a good start. Okay. So if you don't mind, Terry, let me just run, because I went explaining one by one, but let me just take everybody through the whole thing all, to, to just explain how this is regulated in real time, just so folks understand, okay? So essentially here in the normal cell, what happens is you have something, so a growth factor, so this could be a protein, it could be a hormone, binds to this receptor here in the cancer cells. In this example, it's EGFR. And I'll come back to Terry's point about this being a different type of lung cancer in a minute, okay? So this triggers activation, both SHIP2 and SOS1, these two proteins here, these two molecules that you see here. This is gonna trigger KRAS activation. And this ultimately triggers these two pathways here, MAP kinase, mTOR, and this is going to stimulate the cell to grow, divide, and proliferate. Okay? This is normal. This is supposed to happen. But what happens, but the problem starts when the KRAS mutation, as Terry said, when you have that switch from the G to the C or the G to the D, this KRAS protein stays on too much. And this is going to start leading to disruption of the signaling process and is going to lead these cells to go the wrong way. They're going to transform into cancer and that's where the problems start. And then what happens is that where we are right now, this pathway, there's a lot of new medications and new compounds that allow us to target some of these molecules that make this KRAS pathway so that we can hamper the cells from growing, from spreading and shrink that tumor down. And that's what we've been doing and that's what we're gonna be discussing here, okay? Now, Terry, let me just make, uh, make mention to one quick thing that you mentioned about the EGFR, okay? So EGFR is something that we're supposed to have. It's like KRAS, it's, it's there to regulate our cells, to stimulate them when they need to grow, 
to, to, to help fine tune the division of the cancer cells, okay? So this is normal, and even our cancer cells have that. What's abnormal is when you start having too much EGFR in your cells, okay? Or as Terry said, in a different type of lung cancer, when you have an EGFR that also becomes, well, not also, but an EGFR mutation. So the EGFR gene then carries the mutation. That can also lead lung cells to turn into cancer cells and, and have the patient develop cancer, right? And so let me, let me just keep it, keep it in your track. So th that's why when most people, you don't have, I don't want to say never, but very, very rarely would you have an EGFR lung cancer at the same time you have a KRAS lung cancer. It's typically one or the other. So either the switch got faulty at the EGFR space or it got faulty down at the KRAS space, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, and as you said, it's very, very uncommon for you to have a KRAS mutation happening with an EGFR mutation in the same cancer. So the wording that we typically use for this is that they're mutually exclusive. So they don't happen together in the same lung cancer. Okay. So as, let me just see if there's, there's any questions on this. Yeah, so why can't you target EGFR to get to KRAS? That's a good question. We're gonna to get to that. Uh, what if your EGFR negative is it the same pathway? I think we kind of touched upon this right now. And, uh, and yeah, so on the question here in KRAS and BRAF, what's the correlation? I think it's, a, it's the point that we just covered. So they're part of that same pathway, okay? So KRAS sits here in green, BRAF sits here in red. So it's further down, but you can have lung cancers that are triggered by KRAS but you can also have lung cancers that are triggered by BRAF. It's just that BRAF is much less common than KRAS. Which okay, is, so, okay, so, so, okay, so uh -huh. of course, for the, and, and, and I'm sorry for jumping in, but- No, no, that's fine. I, 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 that, that, that was the whole point. That was okay, the whole okay, point. I just I'm wanna sorry. make sure you're okay <laughs> with it, okay. Um, okay, and, but like for a longest time, when KRAS was still considered undruggable, and while we were still looking at it, it quite commonly was being studied along with the BRAF at the same time. And so you'll still see a lot of the data and stuff if you start looking back on it, that it's, it's talking about BRAF and KRAS. Is that why? Is because it was all part of that same pathway and they were trying to target one or the other, right? Yeah, it's part of the same circuit. I, I like the word that, that you used for it. So it, it, that's essentially the reason. So a lot of our efforts in the past that weren't really successful, they were trying to use drugs that we know work for BRAF and trying to apply them for KRAS. So one example is, uh, is a class of medications called MEK inhibitors, so M-E-K, -E so this, this purple box here, right? So this has proven to work for the, for the lung cancers that have BRAF mutations, but unfortunately it wasn't successful for patients that have KRAS mutations. And there's, and there's plenty of negative trials out there confirming that. Right, and so when we're talking about that, just to keep it down, is we're talking about like a MEK inhibitor, like that means it's stopping it. Like if you've got a MEK cancer, or an EGFR inhibitor means you've got the EGFR cancer, the same way we're looking at a KRAS inhibitor. And that means it's stopping it from mutating. Correct. So I think the only comment that I'd make there, Terry, is that the MEK-driven uh, cancers are very, very, very rare. Mm -hmm. So it's very uncommon for you to have MEK-activating mutations as like the, the core mutation in the cancer, okay? So, so, so that's, that's why that's a group that you really don't hear about because it's just very, very uncommon. And, and sometimes the mutations that we see in MEK, we're not 100% sure that they're mutations that trigger cancer. Okay. Okay. So getting back to this very busy section here on the left. So in a nutshell, these first three boxes, they're essentially describing strategies to hit this pathway one way or another, right? 
So if we start off here on top with the adagrasib and cetuximab combination, essentially what we're doing there is that we're combining a drug that turns off KRAS with a drug that blocks EGFR here on top, right? Now, the key point here is what we just mentioned. So in this case, EGFR is not mutated. It's the normal EGFR. And that's what some of the data that we're seeing in mice and cell lines are showing us, that that can actually be one of the ways that the cancer can become resistant to drugs like sodoracib, adagrasib, and the other G12C inhibitors is because when we block KRAS, the number of EGFR molecules in the cancer cell increases. And that can reactivate this circuit here that makes the cancer go. So the, the treatment stops working or it doesn't work. And that's and the reason why this is a combination that so far has been showing has been showing to be promising uh, is the data that I, I think you're familiar with, Terry, that was presented at ESMO last year for specifically colorectal cancer, where there was a pretty impressive uh, efficacy when you combine adagrasib with cetuximab in that population. And the reason why it was so impressive is because if we look at the number of patients where treatment with the G12C inhibitors by themselves, the number of patients where that works is fairly limited. It's about 7 to 17% if you look across the drugs that have been reported right now. But when you combine the cetuximab with adagrasib, that number jumped up to 43%. And that and was in colorectal, correct? That was in colorectal, correct. And that's why now the program has been expanded to not only allow more patients with colorectal to be treated with this combination, okay, but there's also two additional cohorts that were incorporated into the study that's going to be looking at pancreatic and also at non-small cell lung cancer. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me just check the box here. Okay. 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 So I'll, 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 we'll try, I'll get back to those in a second. So within that same rationale, if we go to the second line here, so you have this combination of adagrasib and what, what I joke is the, the license plate numbers, right? I mean, so when these drugs, they don't still, when they still haven't, uh, they haven't been branded, they don't have a name yet. This is how they typically read. So it's typically the first two letters are the name, the, the abbreviation of the manufacturer. And then the rest of the numbers are then going to designate the molecule. So this is a combination of adagrasib with this compound, which is a SOS1 inhibitor. So basically, it's going to block this, this, this molecule here in orange, which activates KRAS. The reason why this is being looked at is because, again, in the studies that have been run in, in cell lines and animal models, it's been shown that this combination of the SOS1 inhibitor with the G12C inhibitor that can bolster the effect of drugs like adagrasin. Okay? And for some circumstances, it's even able to reverse the, the, the resistance that the cancer cell might have acquired to a drug like adagrasin or sodoracin. And then now this drug has been shown as a single agent to be well tolerated. And this is data that's been already published and presented at ASCO. And then now this drug is being combined with that aggressive to see one, if it's safe to be combined. And then number two, to see if, if the efficacy holds up, okay? To see if it's more effective uh, compared to the efficacy of that aggressive by itself. The, Just a, a real quick shout out. So we're going to be able to have access to these slides too. So don't feel like you have to like memorize them or anything. And we're recording this if you, if you need to refer back to it. And also um, we do have all the KRAS trials. And if these aren't on our listing on our website, then we will make sure that they are put there too. So, okay. This third line I left here to let the, 
the patients with pancreatic cancers know that there's also, like we were discussing, Terry and I, before the rest of you joined, so the G12C inhibitors by themselves, they have started to show promise and with good early signs of activity when given by themselves to treat colorectal cancers and to treat pancreatic cancers that have a G12C mutation. So yesterday we saw the, the press release of the, of the efficacy of sotorasim uh, with a response rate of about 22%. And we'd seen last year the efficacy of atagrasib, which was about 50% for patients with pancreatic cancers that have a G12C mutation. The sotorasib data is a little bit more robust at this point, just because it's a bigger number of patients. It's 38 patients that were treated versus 10 patients with atagrasib. So that's why this trial now is ongoing to increase the number of patients uh, treated with atagrasib and the number of patients that have access to these medications. Um, and then the last row here is, is just pretty much a rehash of the first one that we covered, but this is now a phase three, so which means that it's a randomized trial that's going to be looking for approval of the combination of atagrasib and cetuximab versus conventional chemotherapy for patients with colorectal cancers. And you so said this is going to, I'm sorry, this is going to phase three, is that what you said? This is ongoing phase three. Okay, and which means, okay, now just so you all know that it goes from phase three to typically that's where it's approved from. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's, what, that's typically what phase three trials do. They're evaluating if what you're proposing is better than what you already have <clears throat> for treatment of a specific disease. So, so, so that's the rationale here, okay? So, and then just to highlight, like I said, I was gonna uh, make sure that I credit everybody appropriately. So the combination of atagrasib and SOS1 is being run by my colleague, Dr. David Hong in the phase one group here at MD Anderson. Phase one just means that because this is a very novel combination that's just getting into the clinic, it typically is what we call a phase one study when we're looking specifically for safety of the combination as well as efficacy, but the primary focus is the safety. And then this, the, the randomized study here, the phase three study, it's being run by Dr. Kopitz in the gastrointestinal medical oncology department. Okay. I'm gonna pause right here to see if uh, anybody has any questions with the first box. I'm not seeing any questions. Um, I think Dusty asked a good question. Why do we see similar? Why do we not see similar responses to target therapies driven by the same biomarker um, compared from one site location, whether it's colon versus lung or what have you? So that's that's a very good question. Actually, you know, that we're trying to understand right now. But there are a couple of key hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And going back to the BRAF question that that answers some of it, or at least there's some pretty good hypotheses that come from there. So in colorectal cancer, we know that if you have a BRAF mutation, it's not enough if you just block BRAF. You have to block more of this pathway here to get the cancer cell to stop growing. So, so far the combination that's been shown to be the most effective is if you use a three drug combination that blocks EGFR, that blocks BRAF and that blocks MEK altogether. And you were talking specifically in colorectal for- This is in colorectal. And was this just G12C or was this any? No, this is BRAF. This is BRAF okay. B600E. Okay. okay. So, but then if you, so this is, this is the strategy so far for targeted therapy for BRAF colorectal cancer. But if you apply that to BRAF mutant lung cancer, same mutation, same V600E, you just need to block BRAF and MEK. And you not only get the same result, but it's actually better if you compare the numbers in terms of number of patients that control the cancer, number of patients that the cancer shrinks, and time that the cancer stays controlled for. Okay? So that's one of the hypotheses that we have right now is that this EGFR signaling here perhaps is more important for colorectal than it is for lung. 
So what I mean by that is if you just block KRAS and colorectal, this could be triggered to just have more EGFR in the cancer cell. And that's going to reactivate the KRAS by either producing more KRAS molecules, either by activating the mTOR pathway independently of KRAS. So it basically, it basically disrupts the circuit again by figuring out and finding out bypass mechanisms in the circuit where you can start making the cancer cells grow again, right? Or independent of the G12C inhibitor. So that's one of the mechanisms by, by, by means which that could happen, okay? And that's the one hypothesis that I think in, in my personal opinion right now is one of the most, is one of the strongest ones because you have the clinical data from the adagrasib cetuximab cohort that supports that rationale. So if you do sotorasib or adagrasib by yourself, you're stuck with, with a, a number of patients where the cancer shrinks, which is about 15%. If you add on cetuximab, that number goes up to almost uh, to more than 40% of the patients where the cancer shrinks. So I think that that's one of the possibilities, but there are other hypotheses that are being looked at, like for instance, other members and other family members of these EGFR molecule that can also be in that could also suffer an increased expression. So there's a couple of examples like HER2, HER3, HER4, and there's actually data from our group from Dr. Hamak's lab that was uh, that was presented by Dr. Robichaud at the triple meeting last year that actually showed this, where if you block atagras, if you block KRAS with a drug like atagras, uh, atagrasib or sotorasib, that HER2 and HER4 can suffer an increased expression, okay? And that could be an early indication of why the cancer cell can become resistant and can, be, and can go back to growing independent of the G12C inhibitor. Okay. Wait, wait, all right. So let's, let's slow down just for a minute because I don't want to get lost. Okay. It looks sure. really bad if I get lost here. Okay. So you're saying if you turn one spot down, it's kind of like the tide, the tide starts switching. And so the her starts like raising versus like being kind of like level. So at first it's like this. And then it's just, if you start going this way, it starts going too far the opposite direction. That's a good analogy. I like that theory. It, it, that, that's you, you start shifting the balance, right? Because you can assume, so if KRAS is activated, you're like this, right? So you're growing, growing, growing. You block KRAS, you return this to the, to, the status, uh, to the status quo, right? But then what happens is that there's something else that gets triggered here that's gonna start shifting the balance down more towards the cancer cells growing again, but through a different mechanism. So a bypass route in the circuit that can make, it, that can make the circuit start firing again. Okay. I like to picture of it like a waterfall. And it's like, if it gets jammed up one spot, it, that water is going someplace because this needs some sort of a flow. Correct. Okay. And then so I did see a question in here that kind of pertains to this as well. Um, as far as I, um, the chemo with the aggressive and cetuximab versus chemo. Okay. In order to do a trial like that and be a participant of that, do, do you have already have to have been through chemo? This is a trial for previously treated patients. So they have, they must have had at least one standard line of therapy okay, uh, to, be, to, be, uh, to be eligible for this. Okay. And, and, and kind of pertaining to that, I had a conversation right before this tonight. How do you count lines of therapy? If I'm reading like, you know, the requirements and it says how many, you know, I you have to have this many lines or, or whatever. How do I count a line of therapy? So it's, let, let's use the colorectal example since we're talking about that, right? So let's say, for instance, that you were in a, re, a chemo regimen with a drug like 5-FU and then oxaliplatin. So very, two very standard drugs uh, for colorectal cancer, right? And then let's say that the, the, the patient either didn't tolerate it because of side effects uh, or whether the cancer didn't respond or went back to growing, yeah. right? And that forced you to change the medication, to change the treatment that was being administered to a drug, let's say, for instance, like irinotecan, right? Okay. So that counts as one line of therapy. So, so basically, a line of therapy is a regimen that you receive to treat cancer at a certain point in time. 
that's that's essentially what what a line of therapy means. Okay, so, so if I had surgery, so if I had surgery and I I had chemo and then I had surgery and I had two different types of chemo, and but it was all planned at the beginning. Is it considered one line or two lines? So that varies from, from study to study, actually. Okay. okay. So so that's the part where it get this example that you used. It's where it gets tricky sometimes. Okay. So. For instance, there are some studies that will consider that if you had chemo after surgery, for instance, right, and then let's say a year or two years later, your cancer comes back, some trials will consider that chemotherapy that was delivered after surgery, which is what we call adjuvant therapy, they will consider that as a line of therapy. Some studies will not. So it totally depends on how the study is written. Correct. But what I was going to say is that in general, Terry, the closer you are from receiving that adjuvant therapy to the cancer recurring, so let's say like three months, six months. So if you're within that very close window of finishing the adjuvant therapy and the cancer comes back or regrows, that's typically going to be considered a line of therapy one at least one prior line of therapy and the second point is that typically lines of therapy are what we consider the systemic therapy so so either things that you get through an iv things that you get either through a pill okay that, that that's what we call that's typically what we consider a line of therapy surgery radiation they are not considered lines of therapy line of therapy is something that applies only for systemic treatments which can be either IV or oral. Okay, so systemic treatments would be chemo, immunotherapy, any of these targeted therapy, therapy drugs. Targeted therapy, correct. I just, I just want to make sure that we're all tracking at the same time. Absolutely, no, that, that's what I'm here for. And, and that's why I, when I mentioned it to you that I wanted to keep it like this, because I know that there were going to be a lot of questions and, uh, and that, 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 that we could clear up. So uh, that, that's, that's the whole point of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so then continuing down here, I think that for these next boxes, it's going to be a little bit uh, more straightforward now that we cleared all of this. Okay. So this second box here is JDQ443. So this is a new G12C inhibitor that has a similar mechanism of action with drugs like Atagrasib and Sodoracib, okay, but being developed by another manufacturer. It's a drug that's in clinical development now. In fact, it, it, this medication as a single agent is being tested uh, in lung cancers and in colorectal cancers, and it will be called a phase two group of patients. So what that means is that they've been able to show that the medication is safe. They've been able to establish the dose that's recommended, and they're now gonna be enrolling more patients to look at the efficacy of the medication. Okay? And this is an international study, so it's not only accruing in the, in the US, you also have sites participating in Europe, uh, Australia, Asia, and so on. Okay? And then this second line here, the two license plate numbers here, the JDQ443 and the TNO155, this combination is the G12C inhibitor JDQ with the SHIP2 inhibitor, the molecule here in purple. So in a SHIP2 inhibitor, the TNO155. And this combo is being studied for patients that have had some form of treatment for their colorectal or their lung cancer, okay? But they can either be, they, they can either be naive to a G12C inhibitor, meaning that they've never been treated with a G12C inhibitor, whether it be sodoracib, atagrasib, or another one from the drugs that are being developed, or their cancer can have progressed with treatment with the G12C inhibitor. So it's a strategy that can not only increase the efficacy of the G12C inhibitor by itself, but it can also potentially overcome resistance to the G12C inhibitor by itself. Okay. And we do have, like I said before, both preclinical data in, in the lab showing this, but there's also some early signs of, in, with clinical data 
showing that it's possible that when you combine these two strategies, that you can overcome resistance to the, to the G12C inhibitor by itself. Okay. So if I've hit progression on the G12C inhibitor, regardless of what it is, I may want to consider looking into those trials to do for next steps. Correct. Okay. okay. And then the third box here, the, the, the 18, 23, 9, 11 here. This is also a G12C inhibitor, similar mechanism of action to Atagracib, a JDQ and Sotoracib, uh, by, but by a different manufacturer, okay? And this study is actually very similar to the JDQ one. So you, the trial's looking, there's a phase one portion to it where we're trying to look at the safety of the drug and the recommended dose to treat patients. And then subsequently, it's going to expand to treat, a, to treat a bigger number of patients in a phase two cohort to test the efficacy. And as you can see, the second medication here, the, the 170 1963, is the same here that I mentioned previously with, the, with that aggressive. So this is also a SOS1 inhibitor, the, the orange box here that's being blocked by a SOS1 inhibitor here. This combination is, is being tested in a similar fashion. It also allows patients that have never been treated with a G12C inhibitor, as well as patients that have been previously treated with a G12C inhibitor. And the rationale there is to see if we can, if we can bolster the effect of the G12C inhibitor by itself, or to overcome resistance to the G12C inhibitor by itself when it develops. Okay. So both these two studies, so the JDQ1 is active and enrolling, and I'm the PI for this at MD Anderson. And then this third one here is about to open, I believe, within the next month, okay? And, uh, and the study PI for this is, is Dr. Hamak, also the, the chair of thoracic medical oncology at MD Anderson, okay? And then last but not least, so we talked a lot about sotoracib. As everybody knows, this is the standard EG12C inhibitor that's approved right now by the FDA. Uh, the reason why it was approved by the FDA is because it was shown to be able to shrink lung cancers down in almost 40% of the patients. It was able to control the cancer uh, for approximately seven months. And in the patients where the cancer shrunk with the treatment, it was able to sustain that shrinkage for close to a year. So this is why now this is the medication that's approved by the FDA uh, for patients with lung cancer, where the lung cancer has become resistant to either chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or a combination of the two. Okay. And then right now, the combination that we're, that we're looking into, and this is a study, this is a cohort that Dr. Fernandez Escolitas is the PI for, is the combination of G12C inhibitor with an immunotherapy drug called atezolizumab. So let's stop a little bit to talk about what atezolizumab is and what it does. So atezolizumab is one of the immunotherapy drugs that's approved for lung cancer. It's part of a family of medications, which is called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And what this medication does is that it's an IV treatment that's supposed to reactivate your immune system to fight the cancer, right? This is a very standard medication for treatment of lung cancer. It's been approved in multiple settings now, both for patients with stage four lung cancer that have gotten some form of treatment, stage four lung cancer patients that are treatment naive, so no previous treatments. And it's also approved for patients that underwent surgery for their lung cancer. And then this medication would be used as an adjuvant therapy after surgery, because so far it's been shown to decrease the chances of the cancer coming back. And this has been also granted, full, uh, been granted FDA approval based on the preliminary data of, of this study, okay? 
Terry, any questions, uh, anything that, uh, that you want to ask here? Um, no, not particularly. Just, just, to, for, it, it, just so we're not getting tra lost track, this slide here is just on G12C. We kind of walk through the whole how the pathway should work, which applies to all of us, okay, just human beings in general. And to just reflect, the G12, the difference between, say, a G12C and a G12D is just simply your body created the wrong mutant protein. And so it should be creating a G on the 12 spot. And instead it created a C or it created, it should have created a G on a 12 and it created a D or an S or an F or what, what have you. So, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm tracking. And I think we're, um, and Pembro, they were asked if um, Pembro is the same thing um, as a tezolizumab. And they're both, um, I'll let you answer that. You're the doctor, yeah. you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, so essentially, they're what, what I call sister drugs, okay? So they're going to block the same, the same mechanism by which the cancer escapes our immune system, right? So our immune system is supposed to be hardwired to kill cancer cells. That's why we, we're not all of us developing cancer at, all at the same time. And at any given time point, right? So we have that 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 mechanism of protection where these cancer cells are eliminated before they actually turn into a cancer. Okay? So what happens is that this medication is uh, so, so. And one of the mechanisms by which the cancer cell is able to do this is this pathway, which is called PD one and PDL one. So this, is, so this is a mechanism by which the cancer cell latches onto the immune cell and it uses this mechanism to turn the immune cell off in a way that it can't kill it. Okay, so it outlives the, the, the immune cell. So medications like pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, nivolumab, dervalumab, and all, the, uh, and all these other PD-1 or PDL one inhibitors, they work in the same way. They're supposed to block that interaction that shuts the immune cells down in a way that it, they, they get re-engaged and re-stimulated to fight and kill the cancer cells. Okay, okay. and on that same track, I know quite often, and, and totally going to derail this, but uh, we recently saw an article, I think it actually came from MD Anderson, about taking an antihistamine along with your checkpoint inhibitor. And um, like, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, like Zyrtec or, you know, or what have you. Um, is there, do you want to go like a quick run through as far as why we think that works? Or is it just a good idea? Always check with your doctor. We're not giving out general medical information here. Because we're, we're, I mean, you know, I mean, we're just talking about like what should be doing or what it shouldn't be doing. But I, yeah. and it seems to be a, a common solution for a regular problem. Right, exactly. So the way that I would put it, Terry, uh, I would recommend discussing it with your doctor first, okay? the, the, because this is a decision that has to be doctor patient. Okay? Uh, and then more than that, uh, those are still, although they look very interesting, they're still preliminary data. Okay? And uh, so more investigation to be done there. I wouldn't consider that necessarily a standard of care. I think the part that's reassuring to me is that one of the concerns that we have sometimes with immunotherapy is how can other medications negatively impact the effect of the immunotherapy, right? So there are some medication, there's, there's data out there showing, for instance, that your regular PPI, omeprazole, for instance, that can decrease the chances of immunotherapy working, right? Uh, there is data out there that if you need to be on antibiotics for too long, that can mess up the, the, the bacteria that we have in our gut, and that can mess up the effect of the immunotherapy. So there's a pretty substantial body of evidence there for some of these medications, but, but that doesn't mean that you can't take your omeprazole for your heartburn if, you have, if you're getting immunotherapy. It doesn't mean that you can't take antibiotics if you're getting immunotherapy. It just means that there are some medications that are best to be avoided and to avoid using them long-term 
because it could potentially have a negative impact on the immunotherapy and in your cancer treatment. So the way that I looked at this antihistamine data is that I'm excited to see how this research is going to evolve. But I think the part that to me is really reassuring is that because this is an allergy medication, it could have some effect on, the, on your immune system. It doesn't negatively impact uh, the effect of immunotherapy. And it might very well be that you have a beneficial effect as well. And we're going to be continuing to study that. And so it's definitely worth posing the question. Yeah. And, no, and, if you, and, and it's always a good idea to be talking to um, not just your own oncologist, but the, they have a pharmacist specifically that can help you go through. And that's all they do is they, they're the drug dudes and they go through and analyze the different combinations. And, you know, I'm, I'm dating myself, but there used to be an antibiotic you couldn't take along with birth control pills, or if you did, you really stood a, a much higher risk of getting pregnant. And so it's, it's like those sorts of things. So, um, except now we're not talking about pregnancy. Now we're talking about cancer. So check with your, check with your doctor. Um, yeah. So exactly. And, 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 that's, <laughs> and you know, and you very adequately put it, I mean, that's the, you should, there, the pharmacist really helps out with the, with those potential interactions. And, and the, one, the other thing that's important, Terry, that I'd say is, if, especially if you're on a clinical trial, it's very important for all these medications that you're using to be very thoroughly analyzed by your research team, by your doctor, and by your pharmacist, okay? Because especially some of these very early medications, they have the potential to interact with your usual medications, and even other medications that we routinely use to help manage symptoms from cancer patients, so By medications, you mean including supplements and anything kind of OTC, yes. whether you're talking about Tylenol yes. or aspirin or what, or like Absolutely. magnesium or something, right? Absolutely. And also like your Zofrans, your Compazines, uh, the, so your pain medication, whether it be narcotics or not. So very important to always run that list of medications with your pharmacist and, and with your doctor, especially in the context of a clinical trial. And the insurance should just kind of a shout out to the insurance covers like at least one time where they do this full analysis of like your, your whole combo of drugs and the side effects that could be like a result of, um, you know, whether like, you know, a certain like tinnitus or whatever from chemo, different things that are can be potentially induced. So just, just so you know that um, Chris said, you know, uh, so Keytruda and Optivo are kind of like Coke and Pepsi. I could go, I can go with that. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there are some people that uh, will call that an oversimplification, but I think it's close enough. I think, I think it's kind of like Tom's and generic Tom's. <laughs> so what I would say is in particular for lung cancer, the efficacy seems to be pretty similar, okay? Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the trial results, okay. Of course, they don't necessarily. And the reason why I say it's it's, it's close enough, but not in an exact comparison, because all the, both the, the, these medications, as a tezolizumab, have been studied in lung cancer. You have randomized trials that looked at these drugs, but we know that some of them have been shown to be positive in some settings. Others have not, right? So for instance, we don't have an approval for nivolumab in combination with chemo for stage four lung cancer, but we do have an approval for nivolumab in combination with ipilimumab plus two cycles of chemo. So not continuing chemo indefinitely like you have with pembrolizumab. So and there a are a couple of times, and, wait, Okay, just, just uh, slow, slow your roll just a little bit. I'm sorry, <laughs> just a little bit. No, 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 because, no, no, okay, no. because a lot of times it's just that the drug companies have not put in for that combo therapy yet. And so like that's where a lot of these clinical trials start coming down is we're looking at the combination therapies. And so keep in mind that something I had no idea of is that doing clinical trials does not mean you're getting nothing compared to getting some crazy who knows what drug. You're actually getting standard of care compared to something else. Now standard, that may be standard of care plus something or it could be something similar or different, but um, that, that's where it is in the clinical trial. So it's, it shouldn't be as threatening. And I'm so sorry to interrupt. No, 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 absolutely. And so that's why I said that maybe the, the Coke Pepsi uh, analogy, I, it, it sounds really good and it's, it's close enough, but I just be careful with making that generalization because like I said, there are 
Nivolumab is approved in some circumstances, like with, with chemo, but a limited number of chemo cycles, plus ipilimumab. Uh, Pembro is approved but with chemo and by itself, and atezolizumab is approved now with, with chemo and by itself. So there are a couple of differences there uh, that I, I won't get into too much detail here, so, so not to, to delay our conversation here. Uh, but that's, that's I, I think it's all that to say is it's a close enough comparison, but just for keeping in mind, there's some uh, minor differences in terms of approvals uh, between the drugs. Okay. So going back to the combination here, so the rationale for this is because we, we have data, both for sotoracid and for adagracid, that there is the potential that the KRAS G12C inhibitor can increase the amount of immune cells that are coming into the tumor, right? So as the, these drugs start killing off the cancer cells, it can help the immune system come in, recognize those cancer cells and start attacking them. And we have data that, especially in, in mice models, that if you combine the two drugs, the immunotherapy with the G12C inhibitor, you get better results than if you use the two drugs separately. Okay? So that's why we're moving also, not only in terms of blocking these, the, these points of the circuit here, as we were discussing before, but we're also moving towards the combination with immunotherapy now to try to see if we, we can bolster the effect of the G12C inhibitor even further. So you're turning on your human, the, your human immune system in addition to using the artificial like benefit of a, a KRAS inhibitor. Correct. Okay. So that's also an effort that that's, that's ongoing right now. Um, so I'm gonna move over to our next slide. I promise that this one is gonna be a more uh, straightforward one because this one is actually pretty simple. Okay, so for the treatment naive patients with advanced G12C mutant cancers, right? What do we have? And by so naive this, again, you mean? Meaning that they never see, that's where it gets a little bit dicey again, but it would be those patients that haven't been treated with a type of systemic therapy, okay? Uh, and then there is that time frame there as to how many months after you getting adjuvant chemo could you be able to go into something like this? So for the sotoracid one, I don't recall, I, I'm not aware actually, because this study is actually about to be activated at MD Anderson, it's still not there yet, but it's probably gonna be approved within the next one to two months. And Dr. Scalitas is the PI for this, uh, all, this one also. And then for the adagrasib one, you got me there. I will get back to you. I don't, I'm not sure if it's six months or if it's 12 months, okay? That, that it would allow, no prior line of therapy, okay? And this and these two studies, they're focusing on patients that, like I said, that have not never gotten any type of treatment for their stage four lung cancer, okay? Uh, so that's why they're frontline, but these would be the drugs by themselves. So we're looking at efficacy for these two subgroup of patients. Now, why these two specific groups here? Why just PDL1 negative and why just STK11 co-mutation, right? And when you say PDL negative, you mean it doesn't I'm say gonna, negative five or something, right? Right, no, and, and, and I'm, and I'm going to explain what they mean. So okay. <laughs> PDL1 is that number, is that test that you run in the tumor that gives you a number back that goes from zero to 100%, that means how many of your cancer cells have PDL1 expressed in their cervix, okay? The reason why that number is important is because it tells you how likely immunotherapy is to work for treating your cancer, whether it be the immunotherapy by itself, whether it be a combination of immunotherapy drugs, whether it be the immunotherapy with chemotherapy. Okay. So the reason why these two trials, let's say they're picking on that population of lung cancers is because we know that patients that have zero PDL1 expression, so PDL1 negative, 
these are patients where the likelihood of chemo with immunotherapy working is lower and the time for which it works for is lower compared to patients where it's either positive or high positive. So it's a population where what's currently approved isn't that good. So that's why these, th th this soda acid study is looking for this population of lung cancers. Um, the other group of lung cancers that are being picked on here, okay, is the one with STK11 commutations. So STK11, different from what we talked about up until recently uh, in the previous slide, it's one of those genes that's supposed to regulate how our cancer, uh, how our normal cells divide, but by putting a break on it, not stimulating it to grow or to divide. So if we were to think of it, of it like a car, so while KRAS, you're putting your pedal, your pedal to the gas, SDK11 would be the brake. It, it's supposed to hamper cell growth and just stabilize the cell and keep it as it is. Okay. Now, why is that important in the context of KRAS? Because if you have a KRAS G12C mutation, and if you have an STK11 mutation happening on your cancer at the same time, that's a group of KRAS cancers that typically is very resistant to immunotherapy. In other words, it's a type of lung cancer which is really resistant and that immunotherapy does not work well. So SDK11 stubborn. Correct, it's very stubborn. Right? And what we know, like I said, is that it hampers the effect of immunotherapy. It worsens the prognosis of the patients that have this co-mutation and happening, a mutation happening at the same time. Um, and we even have data showing that even chemo is not as good for this type of lung cancer compared to cancers that don't have mutations in this gene. So it's a pretty aggressive type of lung cancer overall. And that's why both of these drugs are being studied for these patients, because it's a population where, where what we have right now, which is immunotherapy with or without chemo, doesn't have a good chance of working. And even if it does, it typically doesn't work for a long time. And that's why we're trying to bring in these drugs early on to try to see if we can get better results compared to chemo and immunotherapy. Yeah, so uh, I see a, a question here in the box, uh, Terry. So yes, SDK11 mutations, they can happen with any type of KRAS, okay? But we know that it's more common for them to happen with, in, in the context of KRAS G12C lung cancers uh, in comparison, for instance, with G12D, for instance, okay? It's actually almost double, okay? So if you have a G12C mutation, you have 30% of the patients that can have an STK11 mutation versus about 15% of the patients if you have a G12D or another type of KRAS mutation. Okay. So like I said, the Sotoracib study is about to be activated. The Adagracib study is open and enrolling and, and I'm the PI for, for this cohort, okay, at MD Anderson. So, uh, we have been accruing to this cohort a lot lately. So I'm, I'm happy to say that, I'm, that we're, we're excited to see if we can push that bar further. It's still ongoing. We don't have preliminary results, uh, but, but we're hoping that, that, that this can be an option that's going to meaningfully impact patients. Yeah, we hope so too. Yeah. Yeah, look around you. <laughs> we're all cheering. <laughs> no, I know, I know. So and so, let's get to one of the oh. Before we get to the to the non G twelve C, so this is another study that I wanted to to mention on the G twelve C space. And I know it's really really blurry. I asked for a better figure, but this is what I got. 
but uh, and, but it's also a very busy one. So I'll just quickly walk you guys through this. So this is going to be the first study that's going to look into a KRAS G12C inhibitor, inhibitor given before surgery. Okay? So it's going to be a combination of sorasib with chemotherapy to try to shrink the tumor down okay, where we're seeing it in the lungs or in the lymph nodes. Okay? to not only increase the chances of us being able to go in and cut out the entire tumor, leave no cancer cell behind in the lung, but also tackle cancer cells that might have migrated this large from the main cancer in the tumor uh, and start spreading. And that could lead the cancer to come back in the future with metastasis. Okay? So this is, this is going to be the combination of what I said of sotoracid with chemo. This is going to be given before the patients go for surgery of their lung cancer. So this would be focused on patients with stage two, stage three lung cancer. They're going to get four cycles of chemo together with sotoracid. Mm -hmm. Terry, you're looking at me funny. Go ahead. No, question. no, no, no. Go I'm ahead. so sorry. I, 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 you know, I guess it's being one of three kids. I just interrupt people. Um, no, I, I, I just, I, because I want to make sure. And it is, a, it is a lot of us for us to take in. Okay. Yeah, I know. And like right. I said, and I apologize for the figure. No, it's, 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 it's all good. Things. We're, we're <laughs> like, we're, but we're, but we're learning. Okay. So, you know, so, you know, we, we, we didn't have the benefit of choosing oncologies. We, we ended up being patients. So it's kind of like how we landed here. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So I just want to make sure. So this would be probably, I don't know. So if somebody was in this, in this meeting tonight, or they were watching the video, okay. Later on, and they may have been like, they just recently been diagnosed and there would be like a G12C and they'd be like, um, like say a stage two or stage three, this might be the sort of trial that they would be able to, to aim at. Right. Yeah. So let me actually take a couple of steps back here, Terry, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay? So when I say neoadjuvant, I mean a type of systemic therapy, so IV or pill, that's given before surgery, okay? so before your definitive treatment. Okay? The rationale... Neo for needs, I have to remember it. Neo means new, yeah. right? So, it's, so, when you're first, so when you're newly diagnosed. Correct. So, so, so it's a neoadjuvant treatment that's given before surgery. So of course, surgery is something that in general, we use when we are trying to treat for cure. So that's why it's usually in earlier stages of cancer. Okay? And the rationale here is if you combine the standard of cure that we have right now, which is chemo, right? Either before or after surgery. If you combine that with the G12C inhibitor soda acid, do you get more shrinkage in the cancer when you cut it out? And do you prevent the cancer from coming back in other areas outside of the lungs and the lymph node in the future? So that's the question for this study, right? Of course, we're gonna be looking at, is it safe to do this, right? Uh, does, it, does, it, uh, does it hamper the capability of patients getting surgery, right? With us being more aggressive, all these things are gonna be studied, right? But the overall goal here is to try to offer something that's more effective, for shrinking down the tumor and for decreasing the chances of it coming back after the surgery. Can, can I just make like a comment here? Okay, so all this stuff that's going to be in this trial is all already FDA approved. It's just this combination is what's in the clinical trial. So the chemotherapy is FDA approved. This okay. is standard for us to do chemo before or after surgery for patients that have stage two or three lung cancer. The novel part of it is incorporating the G12C inhibitor, sotoracin, which we know works in a pretty good number of patients 
that have stage four lung cancer and applying this medication to patients that we're trying to treat for cure and that are planned or expected to undergo surgery for their lung cancer. It makes perfect sense as far as the logic. Okay. So, so like I said, this is a study that, this is one of the ones, sorry, that I mentioned to you that I wanted to, to highlight because this is just posted in clinicaltrials.gov, I think about a, about a month ago or maybe even less than that, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a study that's very, very close to activation, okay? I think we're, we're pretty much just spending some final regulatory per paperwork and this will get activated. So what I can do, Terry, is I can send you an email uh, once this is fully activated, and I can do the same for all the other studies that we talked about that are close or about to be activated as well. Okay, that sounds good. And would you, you know, also let us know when data is posted. Absolutely. Because a lot of times it's like, I mean, we just don't have, I just don't have the staff MDA I understand has. So, and you're kind of right there at the cutting edge. A lot of times, you know, I'm just picking up on it through Twitter or whatever. So it's so helpful um, when you do that. So, yeah. And I want to, I wanted to get to some of the other stuff. I mean, G12C is, is great, but yeah. we're not all part of that club. No, so. of course. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, you and I can also touch base. I think Terry offline on a couple of potential other alternatives to, to even increase uh, the outreach further. But I, but I can run some things by you as well. Some ideas. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. All right. So last but not, well, not, almost last but not least. So what do we have for non G twelve C? Okay. So I'll be honest with everybody here. This is one that's still dragging. I hope that we, we were able to make more prom, uh, more progress in 2022, okay? Uh, but it, it, by the look of things, I think there's a lot of in, uh, exciting compounds that are about or getting close to coming to the clinic, but I think we're not quite as there as I would hope us to be at this point, but we're working. We're pushing. We're doing everything we can to accelerate development of some of the compounds, which are the, the G12B inhibitors, the, the PAN-K RAS inhibitors. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of manufacturers that are working and developing compounds in these two fronts. Okay? Uh, so, uh, but, uh, but we're not quite there yet. I'm hoping that within the next few months, we're gonna start making more progress on that front. And then once we do, I'm, I'm happy to, to have you invite me again, Terry, to, to discuss those non-G12C options with you guys here, okay? Counting down the days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so the, the, so the VS6766, that, okay. is, that started out as a G12V, like victory drug. And um, I know that it's, they've had a lot of success in some gynecological cancers. Um, that are that are KRAS driven, and um, they've been doing some studies on it that are PAN, which means just not just targeting just one specific cancer or KRAS, but like a crossover. And so, like I'm a I'm a G12D, so it might apply to to me or something that is not a G12C. And I'm sure there's probably G12C in folks in there too, but they've got an awful lot of medication options. So have at it. So starting off with the VX6766 that, that, that you mentioned, Terry. So what is this, what does this medication do? Okay. So bring, going back here to our to our circuit here. So MEC purple here. So this is a MEC inhibitor essentially. Okay. So it deactivates MEC and it inhibits the thing that's above it in the circuit, RAF, from activating it. So it's a dual MEC inhibitor. It works by two different mechanisms. Um, and Terry's right that this medication has shown activity for low-grade serious, serious ovarian cancers, but there's also been data that's now published showing that there is activity for lung cancers with KRAS mutations. Okay? Uh, and in particular, the data that was shown up until now but the, the, where they saw the bulk of activity was for KRAS G12B, as in Victor, uh, lung cancers. Okay. So this has led to this study, okay, which is now looking at this MEK inhibitor across a bigger number of patients, 
now really starting to look at the efficacy of this drug for treating KRAS mutant cancers with a specific focus in, in this trial for lung cancer. Okay? So this is an approach, like Terry said, it takes all comers, all KRAS, but the big focus here is going to be non-G12C, and in particular, G12V. Okay? So this study is open and accruing in our department. So this is being run by, by thoracic. So this is one of, one of, our, one of the, the front runners here in our, in our current platform. The other one that I wanted to mention, so this is actually an investigator-initiated study that's led by Dr. Don Gibbons, okay, so one of our thoracic medical oncologists. And it's a similar concept to what we previously discussed with sotoracid and immunotherapy. But instead of using a drug like sotoracid, the medication here that's being tested is called selametinib. So this is a, also a MEK inhibitor here in purple. And it's being combined with one of the, the sister drugs of Atezo, Pembro, and Nivolumab, which is called Durvalumab. So this is a PDL1 inhibitor. And it's being combined with the cousin type of immunotherapy, which is called Tremolimumab. So another. Okay, right. So, I'm we've, got, so we've got, okay, so we've got an immunotherapy. Along two types of immunotherapy. Two, I'm sorry, two, yes. Two types of immunotherapies plus an inhibitor. A MEK inhibitor. MEK right. inhibitor. Okay. okay. The rationale there is that we have data in lung cancer showing that if you combine a PDL1 inhibitor with the CTLA4 inhibitor, it can bolster the effect of immunotherapy. Okay. So that's where the approval for the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab come from. So NIVO, like I said, is a sister drug of nivolumab, and ipilimumab is a sister drug of tremilimumab. Right? So it's a combination of two immunotherapy drugs plus the targeted therapy, the MEK inhibitor. The rationale for that is that we believe that the MEK inhibitor can not only be toxic to the cancer cells because it's blocking the circuit here of KRAS, but more than that, it seems to have a, a potential positive effect on the immune cells. It can potentially stimulate the immune cells together with the, the, the immunotherapy to attack the cancer. So that's the other study that we have right now uh, about uh, for KRAS patients uh, with lung cancer. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to repeat the part about combining the CTLA-4. So, Again, just recapping. So all these drugs that we're discussing here that end in MAP there, they're all part of that big family of immune checkpoint inhibitors, okay? So Dervalimab, Nivolumab, Tremulumab, Ipilumumab, Pembrolizumab, Atezolizumab, like this big list is that family of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So remember, what, what is a checkpoint inhibitor? It's that link that the cancer cells can use to turn off the immune cells and stop the immune cells from killing the cancer cell. Right? So the dervalimab and tremulimumab combination is tackling two of those mechanisms. One of them is PD-1 and PDL one The other one is CTLA-4. So if you block them, the two of them together, the hope is that you will stimulate and, and, and intensify the, effect, the attack of the immune system on the cancer cell. And then we bring in the MEK inhibitor to further intensify that stimulation of the immune system and also start hitting the cancer as a form of targeted therapy. Okay. okay. Did that answer your question about the CT LA4? Um, I'm not sure if we asked it. Um, and it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's not on here. Okay, just it just as, as a side note, because I felt really important when I found this out, an IB, if it ends with IB, it's an inhibitor of some sort. Okay, and if it, end, if it ends with AB, it's a type of immunotherapy. So the AB means that it's an antibody. Antibody, okay, there you go. 
Right. Now you're and showing off your. Now you're just showing off because you're. Oh, sorry, <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm sorry. Thanks for being. <laughs> thanks for being a good sport. Of course, no, that's what I'm here <laughs> for. And then, uh, and then the IV, as you said, it's typically an inhibitor of something uh, that that that's being triggered by the cancer in some way. And the rest of it is just totally random letters that they just throw at. <laughs> you know, so. We're going to say that there's like a, a super huge rationale for it. That, but no, it's it's in general, it's just like uh, the impression I have is it's somebody playing Scrabble and then they just picked up the letters that they found and just put them together and came up with a name. Oh yeah, or it's like the name of all the scientists that found it. They just scrabble them up and then this is what we got. So okay, <laughs> so I'm sorry, I didn't mean to derail the whole thing, but no worries, uh, no okay, but, but it's, then, pro it's probably been a lot. Long day. It's been a long day for a lot of us, and we're really we're holding our own here. But okay, so I, I wanted to so this the the um, the VS sixty seven sixty six is is taking more. It's taking all comers, not just G twelve C, and the other one, the fourteen eighty seven, um, the two immunotherapies and the inhibitor is um, is also taking non G twelve C. So this uh, yeah. So this is all non G twelve C. Yes. And this is these two lung cancer. Okay. And these are just in lung. These two studies there? Yes. Okay. And um, and these are all studies that what you've discussed tonight are all studies at MD Anderson. And just so y'all know, because not everybody has the opportunity to, to go there, um, that they some of these studies, I don't I don't know about these specific studies, but there are clinical trials are often offered at more than one location. Okay, and a lot of times people come in, or they'll go to MD Anderson or in another amazing, wonderful place like that, get a second opinion, and you may be traveling back and forth to be able to become involved in, in one of this, in one of these studies. Did I say anything wrong? No, no, okay. you said everything absolutely right. Okay, um, let's see, and then let's see, interesting find out. There's a the question topic. from Dan, yeah, so 1133, Right, that drug is still not ready for prime time. Right? That's one of the ones that I mentioned before that are that are not quite there yet. Okay. So but, it, but year, it, hopefully. Yeah, so that's that's one of the ones that's currently in preclinical development. And uh, we're, we're waiting for, for when it's going to be ready for prime time. Okay. So the mice are benefiting for right now, is what I'm hearing. Yeah. So, and then Terry, just to, end, to recap what you were saying. So the studies that I mentioned that are investigator initiated. So this one, the Dervalimab, Tremelimab, Selimetinib, that's only at MD Anderson. Okay. And, and this one here, the neoadjuvant one, it's going to be, I believe, three different sites. Okay. And, and we're going to be the main site for it. Okay. Right? So, so the, these would be a specific two that you, you need to come to MD Anderson to be able to participate on. Right. 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 And, um, and yes, the studies, it, yeah, the studies are, no, there's not enough of them in the Midwest. Um, and I know that there's some, okay, I can't remember the official name. I keep thinking of them as pop-up clinical trials, and that's not really what it is, where there's some, some that they can actually do locally for you. Um, and I'm blanking on, on what the name, name is, but um, circle back with me because I mean, in Midwest, depending on where you are, whether you're going through Northwestern or you're going through Mayo, there are places um, across the Midwest, Kansas, um, depending where you are. You're in Canada, do you have a partner with Canadian? Yes, Mayo, yeah. And I, we talked to them at Mayo there too, um, in Canada. Yeah, there are Canadian clinical trials and all these things are all listed there in the listing of the clinical trials as well, so. And the other comment that I was gonna to make, Terry, is like, although these are the two investigator initiated, like this whole pipeline that we're going through right now, this, this combination of trials it would be only available here at MD Anderson. Yes. Okay? So that's something that's important to highlight, okay? Yes, and we're gonna post all this, um, like I'll take copies of your slides and we'll post this like all, all in one spot as well. So, yeah. so that they're easier for y'all to find. And um, it's, I know it helps me when I look back at the exact same slide that I was looking at before. And so to refresh our memory as far as like the pathways and you know and how the EGFR works in combination with SOS1 or what have you. Um, 
So yeah, well, it was Sandy. Sandy is saying about navigating the trials. Yeah, it is. It is tough, um, but we, we can help you out best we can. So, all right. Does anybody have a question in here? Just go ahead and post it in the chat. Because I'm I can see that we're coming up at eight o'clock. And, you know, and, and, and that's why and I, 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 I was trying to see if I can get to the last slide because okay. I oh, I'm so that, sorry. I didn't know you had no, another. No, 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 no. And you're going to understand why because the very first question that we got from Jake Williams was in regards to the last slide, and I promised him that we would get to it. Oh, okay. So yeah. So please do. <laughs> so let me just get to that one, and then we'll, we'll open it up for for. Okay, for I'll be quiet. For questions. So this is the one that really gets complicated. Okay, but I'm going to try to digest this as much as I possibly can. Okay, and I'm going to try to explain it like I explain it to my patients. Okay. So everything that we talked about immunotherapy up until now is medications that stimulate your immune system to fight the cancer. Okay. So what we've been working on is a way where instead of just trying to stimulate the cancer cells, why not stimulate the immune cells? Why not program directly the immune cells to fight the cancer, right? So this is essentially what adopted T cell therapy is. It means that we're gonna use immune cells, whether it be from your tumor, from your blood, and program them or train them in a way that they get really activated to kill cancer cells. That's what this means. Okay. So we've been working on a trial now for a few years where instead of the focus being like using medications to turn off things here and there in that circuit, we developed a trial where the focus is to train the cancer cells, the immune cells to kill the cancer cells. The technology has two problems. One, you need to have the right target and your immune system needs to be compatible with the technology. Okay? So the right target here means KRAS mutations in your tumor, or P53 mutations in your tumor, which it's good because these are the, what, two of the most prevalent genes in cancer. And the way that this works is that if your cancer has that KRAS mutation, and if your blood, if your if your immune system is compatible, and that and that we test through a blood test. We use this technology to take your own immune cells out and we put in there the right way for them to find the cancer and kill it, which is essentially a receptor in the immune cell that's gonna latch to the target in the cancer cell. Okay. The reason why this is such a novel approach is because engineering the immune cells is something that's not trivial. Okay. And applying this technology is complicated because we need to use first, take the, the first step is taking out the immune cells to program them. Then we need to admit the patient to do very high dose chemotherapies, which are different than the ones that you probably heard of. Like they're not carboplatin, they're not oxaliplatin, they're not, uh, they're not ironotecan, they're not pemetrexid. It's very high dose chemotherapy drugs that we typically use to treat leukemias. So like fludarabine, a cyclophosphamide. The idea is that these chemotherapy drugs wipe out immune cells that are helping the cancer and sustaining it. So it's regulatory immune cells that shut off our good immune cells that are supposed to tackle the cancer and are not doing so. So we use that high dose chemotherapy to clean up those cells. And then after that, those cells that we had, the immune cells that we had taken out, that we, that we trained them, that we programmed them to fight the cancer, we administered them to the patient. Okay. And that's also something that needs to be done in the hospital. 
because these immune cells are going to be hungry to eat cancer. And that immune response that you get from all these immune cells, and we're talking about like putting in like a billion plus cells, immune cells in your bloodstream, very almost at the same time, that can really stimulate the immune, that, that can really activate these immune cells and cause a lot of inflammation in the body very early on. And that's why the patient needs to be monitored within the hospital, okay, to make sure that they're tolerating it well, that their organs are tolerating the treatment well. And we now have a team at MD Anderson that just does this. It's called the CARD Talks team. So it's essentially a team that was set up together to specialize in managing side effects from this type of technology, this T cell therapy. Okay. So this is a study that literally just activated last month. Okay. So this is a treatment protocol that's looking for patients that have KRAS, G12D, and G12V at this point, because these are the ones where we're able to program the immune cells to fight the cancer at this point. But we are working to expand those possibilities to other types of KRAS mutations. Okay. And this is one that we developed together with the sponsor uh, and that we've been working on, like I said, for the last few years, and now we're all ready to go. Um, and, and this is one that's only at MD Anderson right now. Okay, so, and as I listed below, this is open for lung cancer patients, colorectal cancer patients, pancreatic cancer patients, cholangiocarcinoma patients, and ovarian cancer patients, okay? Looks intriguing. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions here. So how is this different from TIL trial? So TIL means tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So you're basically taking lymphocytes that are in the tumor that you acquired through a surgery to remove a piece of the tumor or to take, all, uh, take out a nodule or a mass. You extract those immune cells you give them hormones in the lab to activate them and to make them grow. And you put them back in the patient, you administer it to the patient. So it's, an, it's a more of an unselected approach where you're hoping that the right immune cells are in there in the right quantity and in the right proportion. And that by expanding them, that will be enough for you to trigger uh, an immune reaction to fight the cancer. This trial that we're talking about, we're actually taking normal immune cells that you have in your blood, right, that we took out before the treatment, and we're putting in there the DNA to produce the right receptor to hunt down your KRAS mutation or your P53 mutation and kill the cancer cell. So although it's two different... It, Although it's two different types, it's still both of them are T cell therapies, but they're different types of T cell therapies. So then the, the other question that we had here, Terry, what about uh, G12S? No, unfortunately, right now, G12S is not covered. It's one of the alleles that we're trying, one of the mutations that we're trying to cover, okay, for this trial. Uh, when do you expect to dose your first patient? So that's actually a pretty good question. So I consented the first patient uh, about two weeks ago, and we're getting the patient ready to start. So we're expecting the first patient to be treated in March. Okay. Um, and what's the timeline of expanding the trial to include other KRA as mutations between? Okay. So the G G12D and G12V were ready to go. The timeline for this is a little bit tricky because we rely on other studies to identify the right programming for the T cells. So the target that they're hunting for here, the immune cells, is the KRAS mutation, okay? But remember, I just showed you in the figure that KRAS is inside the cell, right? 
Mm -hmm. So how are the immune cells going to find something that's inside the cell? So there is a device in all of our cells, including the cancer cell, which is called MHC, which is a structure that's designed to present everything that's being produced in the, in the cell on the cell surface. So basically, if you have your KRAS mutation there, it's going to generate a mutant KRAS molecule. That molecule, same as all the other ones that we have in our body, they're broken down in the cell into very tiny fragments. And these fragments are placed on this MHC receptor and transported to the surface of the cancer cell. So it's, th it's this thing here that you can see here, the MHC molecule. So this is the tumor cell. This is that receptor, right? Look at your mouse. Are you pointing to the screen because I can't see it at all? Oh, sorry. This the, it, it's. Uh, can you see? Oh, what okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Now I can. Sorry. Yeah. I, again, like old eyes. And <laughs> so this is something that was actually developed to help us fight infections. So like virus that viruses that latch inside our cells, the proteins that the virus produces inside our cells. That's how the immune system recognizes it because these MHC molecules take the viral proteins to the surface of the cell, and then our immune cells are able to recognize it through this purple thing here, which is the TCR receptor. Okay, so, um, all right, so hang on. I, this is still a new science thing to me, so. Yeah, no, right, no, no. That's why I said that this was gonna be the tough one. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so, all right, so, you know, bear with my new analogies, okay? Sure. Um, sometimes I've got old ones. So it's kind of like getting the cream to rise to the top so that you know what's there, and then you can target that? Is that kind of what you're saying? Right, so the, what I'm saying is that this is a system that's present in all of our cells, every single one, normal or cancer. And it's part of the way that our body allows our immune system to recognize anything that's foreign, okay? So whether it be a virus, whether it be cancer, Okay, so this is a normal a device that's in our cells. Mm -hmm. right? What the trial here is looking for is the KRAS mutation is going to generate this fragment. Okay, the name that we give it is called neoantigen. Okay, so antigen is everything that's foreign to our body. Okay, so it's a new antigen that the cancer mutation generated in the cell. This fragment is going to be placed on this MHC molecule inside the cell and transported to the cell surface to allow the immune cell, the T cell, to recognize it. Okay. And because this is foreign, it will latch onto it and will kill. It. So this is what actually should happen. This is what the immune, our immune cells should do to avoid cancer from showing up, right? But because of reasons like the checkpoint inhibitors and other mechanisms, the tumor is able to escape these mechanisms of what we call immune surveillance. So monitoring our body to make sure that there are no cancer cells that are emerging. But that's the way, that, that's one of the mechanisms by which cancer can escape, it can escape and grow. It enables this, uh, the, the T cells to be turned off it, 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 it hampers the recognition capabilities by the T cells. So that's why they grow. So what this study is doing is instead of relying on our own immune cells to be activated by things like pembrolizumab, nivolumab, and so on, we're getting the immune cells and we're training them directly by putting the receptor that they need to hunt the cancer cells down into the immune cell and then transferring them back into the patient. Right? Like a bomb sniffing dog, it's finding the, the bomb. It's essentially more or less what you would do, like your dog is misbehaving, right? It's not doing what you tell it to do, right? So you take them, you put them in school for like a, for a dog training school for like two or three weeks, and then they give you back the, the, your dog, and then it's well behaved and it's well trained and it knows what it's supposed to. You clearly to. have never had a dog. Yeah, I know. <laughs> as, 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 I was, as I was saying it, I said, "No, that's not a good analogy," but I'm going to do my best. So yeah, that's not how it works with kids either. Just putting it out there. Oh no, no that one I have no, no doubt that it's, it doesn't work that way. I'm sure of it. 
Sorry. But, but that's but that's essentially what you're doing. So you're taking out the immune cells from that hostile envir environment that the cancer is generating, and then you're making them, and then you're training and programming them to go back in and fight the battle. Right? So that's the rationale. For it. Okay. I liked my bomb sniffing dog, but I guess you didn't. You didn't like it. So that I, I'm thinking because it can find the cancer then, right? And so it's kind of like you train a, a, a bomb sniffing dog to find it and then you reward it. And so you're rewarding and saying, here, go, go find the cancer. That's kind of and what I was it. thinking. And kill it. Go hunt it and down. Kill it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And kill it. And then the reason, Terry, that this is a technology that, I mean, of course, we're, we're not the only groups working on adopted T cell therapies for solid cancers. This is, this is a, a field effort. But this approach of hunting down the specific KRAS mutation is quite unique. Okay. And this, is, and this study is now open at MD Anderson, like I said. I saw a question here in the chat. It's not G12B plus G12V in the same patient. It's or. It's G12B or G12V, okay? So that's another question that was there. And the, and the reason why this is quite exciting is because there are other ways that you can use adopted T cell therapies in solid tumors, like for instance, TILS is, an, is one of those examples. And we have data from other solid tumors like melanoma, head and neck cancer, especially the head and neck cancers related to HPV, that with this type of T cell therapy, if you're able to induce a significant response, a complete response in terms of tumor shrinkage, a lot of these patients can have very durable responses that can last even for years. This is what the most updated data that we're seeing that are coming from, uh, from other centers in the US are showing for things like lymphomas, leukemias, but also for, for solid tumors. So it's, it's an aggressive, it's a complicated approach, but it has that extra leverage, okay? We know that it's far from perfect. Like the, the data that we have with TIL therapy, uh, about a quarter of the patients would have a response, okay? But those unique patients that had those complete responses where the tumor pretty much essentially disappeared, okay? Those patients can have very prolonged responses, okay? So this is one of the, the trials that's also for non-G12C uh, across a variety there of different cancer types uh, that, were, that we recently activated and that we're looking uh, for patients right now. Okay, so if I was interested in this trial or a different trial, how do I go about doing that? Come down to see us. Houston's lovely this time of year. <laughs> So, so we yeah, can't just show up on your doorstep. <laughs> yeah, so as, as you and I talked before, Terry, uh, I think we, we have a really good business office, both the GI department and the thoracic department. Okay. Uh, I, I, I can share the, the contact information for all those. Okay. Uh, set up an appointment. The, the first visit is always a hassle for the patients. I won't lie because they're coming in everything is new. They, they don't know the doctors. They don't know the team. Uh, once they come in, we are going to have to start working on all these steps to screen for the trials, run additional tests if are needed. But once we iron out that first visit, things become much, much more smoother. And then and, and all of our doctors are trained on all these protocols. All the thoracic and all the GI uh, medical oncologists are well-versed and trained in the protocols that we discussed. So whoever you see is gonna be aware of these protocols and we'll, we'll, we'll get the patient screened, uh, consented, and with whatever the best trials we have at, at a certain time point are. And right now is what I presented to you is, is state of the art, uh, what we have and what we consider to be the most promising and that we're actively engaged in. And yeah, and, and if you're working um, through another location, this is an MD, MD Anderson location. Um, or is that something that they do on different sites as well? No, this pipeline that I showed you is restricted to, to the Houston area sites. Okay. So it's going to be the main campus, the majority of them. 
And then some specific ones are going to be at locations like the Woodlands, Katy, Sugarland, League City. But the bulk of these trials, uh, they're, they're going to be centered on the main campus. Okay. And because I didn't know that, this is why I'm, I'm sharing this with people is because you guys get the benefit of me being an idiot and being um, volunteering that information. I thought you would just volunteer for a trial. And it's like they should consider themselves lucky that they get you. That's not quite how that works. You have to qualify to make sure that you're a good match for the trial. And, right. Um, so, right. Yeah. So the, the way that I also explain this to patients, Terry, is that unfortunately clinical trials, they don't play by our rules. They kind of play by theirs. Right. And there's a rationale behind that is because a lot of these technologies, they're, they're new, they're innovative, right? And we wanna make sure that we're not getting people in harm's way by enrolling them into a clinical trial. Uh, we're always uh, happy about what the patients are offering, they're giving and to be able to participate in these trials, which is a lot sometimes like with the travel, uh, just being away from family, potential for side effects and so on. But that's also part of the reason that we want to make sure that we're not getting anybody in harm's way uh, with these trials. And that's why some of these have pretty strict criteria. Okay, so we want to make sure you're matched to the right thing. Right. That yeah, just right. because you have a G a G12 D does not mean that you're going to qualify for that trial. And it's different. So right. we're trying to get you set up. So okay. and then and, and there's a question from Jake here, Terry, which I think mm -hmm. is important to comment. So a lot of the, what this trial is, like this trial is unique. It's being run by us. But like I said before, it, this, this doesn't mean that it's the only adopted T-cell therapy that's out there for solid tumor, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there are data from other academic cancer centers. Uh, Jake cited, like for instance, the, the, the NCI trial, that, that you're absolutely right, that's also open, that's, uh, open in Maryland. But I just want to highlight that even though they're adopted T-cell therapies. They're different trials, okay? Yeah, so, okay. We have kept you late. Oh, no, it, it was my pleasure. I always have uh, like having these conversations. So, I mean, I hope I didn't bore everybody with because it was a lot of information that we covered, okay? Well, they're still uh, here, so they must they must select you. Yeah, no, that's what that's that's what I was going to say. So, I'm, I mean, I'm more than happy to take any questions uh, that the, that everybody has. So, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, if, from any, if anybody wants to like just like read, because we're getting sm we're getting sm it's more manageable now because like you know some people probably had to go. They are probably like bedtime or something. I don't know dinner. <laughs> Um, okay. Yes. I, I thank you. Rosemary's right. You was fantastic. And you did do an excellent job explaining everything. And you were very tolerant with me interrupting and even pointing out that you probably never had a dog before <laughs> um, because it became blatantly obvious. <laughs> it's not but how it works getting a dog. You send them away for two weeks. They come back. They're well behaved. No, 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 no. Um, and our antibodies plus chemo, a new concept. I'll let you, you're the doc, you get to answer me all these. <laughs> so, uh, so there are antibody concepts being studied with chemo. I try to highlight uh, the, the trials that are more applicable to, for specifically for KRAS, because that's, that's the main focus of the talk here. But yes, there are more unspecific trials that don't necessarily uh, require the patient to have KRAS mutations. And then there are combinations with, with chemotherapies, with other types of immunotherapies that are not necessarily immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, combinations with antibodies. Uh, so there, there's a wide range of, one of the other things that's gaining a lot of traction right now is the antibody drug conjugates. So there's a couple of examples for other types of lung cancer like EGFR and HER2 that are currently under clinical development. Uh, but, but those would be separate studies, not necessarily focusing on KRAS. But yes, the, the, there are other trials with what you mentioned, as well as other treatment modalities that will take KRAS, uh, patients with KRAS mutations, but that's just not a specific KRAS approach. Right. And that applies to the other types of KRAS mutations, like such as colorectal or ovarian yeah. or pancreatic or well, it's just you're in the thoracic space. So, um, 
How can you best get an appointment with Dr. Kopetz? Uh, <laughs> So I'll, I'll provide you that, the, the contact information, Terry. I think it's going to be important. Let me, I'll, I'll reach out to our business offices, both on the thoracic and on the GI side, okay. uh, to try to see if, uh, if I can get that information to you. I'm pretty sure I can. So, but yeah, I'll, and, I'll, I'll and, and I do have, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I, if, if I don't know people, it's like we just kind of, I, I can pester somebody who pesters somebody who pesters somebody, you know. So um, yeah, so you guys don't don't hesitate to reach out to me um, by email. And if I for somehow you hit my spam and I miss you, please hit me back up again. So okay, uh, does anybody have any other questions? Um, I'm not looking. I'm not seeing any. Um, okay, CTT. All right, all right. Lynn keeps asking this question, so I'm gonna have you take a shot at it. Okay. So all right. You have a tumor, you cut out the tumor, okay? You have a KRIS, whatever tumor, you cut it out. Does that mean it's not going to come back with the same KRIS again? Right, so the straightforward answer to that question is, if you have ctDNA undetectable after a surgical resection, the data that we have right now suggests that the likelihood of your cancer coming back is very low. It's not zero, but it's very low, okay? So right now, there's a, th th there seems to be a prognostic signal that if you clear C tumor ctDNA, so tumor the circulating ctDNA DNA, is the circulating yeah. tumor DNA. Yeah. So circulating tumor DNA after your surgery, the odds are in your favor and your likelihood of having a recurrence is much lower compared to patients that still have tumor DNA detectable in their blood after the surgery. Okay? So for right now, the, the most solid data that we have has a prognostic value to it. Now, there are clinical trials that are starting to look into strategies of intensifying, so making the treatment, I wouldn't say the word more aggressive, but yeah, really intensifying it to try to bolster chances uh, of cure or, or prolong disease control if you have a stage four cancer. So let me give you an example, right? And this is something that uh, the, the GI department at MD Anderson has been heavily involved. And I think somebody mentioned Dr. Benny Johnson on top. He's one that it, that's one of the, the, the team members that's working closely with this. What if you try something like, for instance, chemotherapy after your surgery, right? And then after the chemotherapy, your tumor hasn't seemed to, sh to have shrunken down a lot, but your ctDNA is negative right? Go ahead with surgery. But what if it's still positive? Can we do something extra before the surgery to try to see if we can clear that ctDNA to get you to a better place to go to surgery, right? So that would be one possibility. The other one is, so I started my EGFR inhibitor, right? Uh, and so a specific type of targeted therapy for lung cancer. After three months, I repeated my ctDNA and it's still positive. Is there anything extra that I can do to prolong my, my chances of the, or increase my chances of the cancer being controlled? So these are some of the examples of clinical trials with a, with a therapeutic purpose, with a treatment intent that are being developed right now. Did that answer your question, Lynn? Poor Lynn and I have been going back and forth, what, three or four different doctors. So did that answer your question? Yeah? Okay, you're, you're muted. I think I have to unmute you. You're muted. Okay, okay I, I think it kind of answered your question because what, what, what is this, this um, she had surgery and there's no CT DNA. And so we were just kind of like, okay, can it come back? And is it going to come back? And if it comes back, is it going to come back as it as what it was to begin with, or is it going to come back as something different? Yeah. So yeah. And it sounds but, like there's no definitive answer. So, I, like I said, I think right now the, the clear value here seems to be prognosis, right? I mean, if if you if you get treated for your for your lung cancer, your colorectal cancer, and you clear the tumor DNA from your blood your prognosis is much more favorable compared to somebody 
that, that, that still has tumor DNA in their blood, right? Uh, but the treatment, we're still working on. There, there are trials that are starting to develop, but this is right now most heavily focused still in clinical trials. Um, there was an interesting question here, Terry. Uh, yes, Lynn. So the so, chances are better that your lung cancer won't, re won't return. Yes. So there's a question here for, from Ian Hyman. So could your KRAS mutation change over the course of treatment? So this is a, this is a good question. It's actually a pretty interesting one. So the answer is yes. Okay. And specifically in the context of treatment with the G12C inhibitors. So there is data published out there that one potential mechanism of resistance to KRAS G12C inhibitors is that you can have this shift from G12C to G12V to G12D, okay? It seems like the, this is, um, it could be an adaptive mechanism of response, meaning that there could have been, that, that this is an acquired new mutation in the cancer cells, but there is the possibility that there was a very small number of, of tumor cells that actually harbored that other mutation. And when you threw in the G12C inhibitor, you killed off all the G12C cells. And then that enabled those dormant cells or their, that minority of the cells to grow back up and become the dominant cancer cell population. So this is, this is kind of like evolution, right? I mean, you basically, you put stress in the environment, you wipe out the members of a species that have that specific trait, and that enables that other minority to emerge. Okay. So this is essentially like, th this is kind of like, a, it's really Darwin to some extent. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, drugs that cross the blood brain barrier, um, specifically uh, so So right now the data that we have out there is really for just for soda acid. It seems like the activity is fairly limited in terms of penetration into the brain. Most, uh, it was a small number of patients that what was presented at World Lung uh, last year, but the activity seemed to be mostly stable disease and in a small proportion of the patients. For the other agents, we still don't know. Uh, there's likely gonna be data coming from, from these other compounds because this is always a hot topic when it comes to targeted therapy especially because of other cancer types and other molecules, uh, but, but more data to come. Okay. All right. Um, right. Yeah, so the, 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 yeah. the KRS you told me in question here, the MRTX 1133 is the one that I mentioned that's been postponed in terms of starting clinical development. So we still don't know exactly what the timeline is going to be right now. Yeah, I think I saw something saying second half of the year is where it's looking. Yeah. So, you know, um, so for the soda, a photo of soda phase two trial, there are a few people with complete response. What's the status of those patients now? We'll see. I'm pretty sure that we're going to get updates on the trial. I believe that the data that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think the medium follow up was either 10 or 12 months, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we're bound to have updates this year at, at any of the, uh, the usual cancer meetings that, that Terry mentioned in the beginning, like AACR, ASCO, uh, the World Lung Cancer Conference, uh, ESMO. So we're, we're bound to have more information for those patients. And I think, I believe in the very near future. Okay. And then last one, cause it's eight 30. And so like, maybe, maybe you'll keep going all night, but I'm starting to wear down. Okay. Um, all right. So the side effects from ship two were rough on some KRS G12C patients. Have the dosages been adjusted? Right. So that's, that's also a good question. So that's why the trial that I presented to, to the, to the group here, the JDQ plus the TNO, that's why that's still in dose escalation uh, and a very careful dose escalation, by the way. Uh, to make sure that we're reaching a dose that we're confident is effective, but also that's safe and well tolerated by the patients. But unfortunately, it's one of the it's one of the things in oncology that that, that we always know. If if you start combining drugs, you are going to start to see more side effects. 
but that's why we always have to be very, very mindful and very careful when these drugs and these combinations are in dose escalation. So when we're trying to look at the, their safety and what the right dose for the combinations are to make sure that we don't make it too toxic and make it tolerable for the patients. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. Well, Cause we still need no, to have very. a quality of life with it for sure. Right, and, 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 and one point to highlight, Terry, is that, so if you look, for instance, at two of the soda acid combinations that there, were, there was data presented on last year, right at the triple meeting. So the soda acid of fatinib combination, the soda acid trametinib combination, you could clearly see that there was a lot of side effects coming from that combination. A lot of diarrhea, a lot of skin rash. I mean, I, I, I know that they, they were reported as manageable, but I mean, we know for patients that that's hard. It's, it, it can really hamper quality of life, okay? And it could very well be that that impacted to some extent the, the, the dose intensity, right? The amount of treatment that the patients were able to tolerate and of course, for targeted therapies, that has a really meaningful, it could have a very meaningful impact in terms of efficacy. Mm -hmm. So that's why these combinations have, be, have to be very carefully tested to make sure that we're getting to an effective dose, but also to a tolerable dose that allows the patients to have good quality of life, but also that allows them to continue the treatment to make sure that we're getting good efficacy uh, from the regimen that they're, that they're being treated with. Okay, great. All right. Well, Thank you guys for all being here tonight and listening to this. And thank you, Dr. Let's see if I can do it right. Cause now not Dr. Negraro. Negraro. We'll practice some more the next time. Yeah, okay. You just need to come back again. And um, yeah. And, and thank you so much for being a good sport and letting me interrupt you and ask a million questions, Be, you know, but we're, we're still trying to wrap our brains around it. And, you know, and, and see what's all going on. And, you know, when we said, oh, I'm only bringing five slides. It's like, we had a hard time getting through all five, right? <laughs> so, um, but yes, please do give me the contact information. And if y'all miss any part of this, we're going to have this recorded so that you can listen to it again and look at the cells or look at the cells. I am getting tired. Look at, look at the slides in order to be able to um, see what's going on and um, ask, question, ask questions and what have you. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Sorry, again, thank you so much for the invitation. It really was a privilege here. I really enjoyed participating and answering the questions and walking you guys through this. And, and I hope to be back here in, in the very near future with more exciting trials for us to discuss and with, uh, with additional opportunities here so that uh, we can increase the our, 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 our pipeline here and give even more options for our patients. Okay. Oh, definitely. That's, I mean, that's really the aim, right? And yeah. so, yeah, we'll be looking forward to getting that information and start coming back with you real soon. And I'll let y'all know what the meetings are that are coming on up too. So, okay. So with that, we're, I'm officially shutting it all down. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for being my people and listening and putting up with me too. So, and thank you. We'll see you again real soon. Okay. Thank y'all. Have a good night. Bye, guys. Have a good night. Bye.